Hello everybody, my name is Natalia Pietrzak and it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you and to present you my experience in GTS and X. Today we'll be focused on numerical modeling of dynamic phenomena in geotechnical engineering. So let's start. First, I'd like to give you the scope of the presentation. We'll start with a seismic soil structure interaction definition. Then I'll show you the role of finite element modeling and types of dynamic analysis. Then I'll show you the seismic boundary conditions and different types of dynamic loading. And finally, I will apply the information provided on the example of a driven pile. A few words about the company which I represent here for you. The Dynafa Solution is a team of exceptional, talented people for whom numerical modeling is a common passion. This is quite a unique company because it brings together the specialists from different branches of civil engineering. Thanks to this, we can solve unusual and typical engineering problems. And even though the company is relatively young, we have qualified and experienced people working together. And moreover, thanks to university connections, we can also deal with scientific problems, which might just take us a bit longer. We'll try to answer the question now, what is dynamic analysis? Is the study of the response of a structural system subjected to a load changing over time, the so-called dynamic loading? This response can be obtained by going on a building site, installing the sensors and measuring the acceleration. But if the structure doesn't exist or the source doesn't exist, we can simulate that response using the FEM computer program like GTS and X. Dynamic analysis will ensure not only safety but also comfort for people. Legal regulations clearly impose the necessity to perform a dynamic analysis for all structural objects within the range of the impact of vibrations. Of course, each country has its own laws that must be followed. But here in Europe, we have, of course, European standards. Engineering structures are constantly exposed to various types of dynamic impact. The source may be natural, like wind load or earthquakes, as well as the vibrations caused by human activity, like the operation of machines, moving vehicles, construction works, or rock baths in mines. What if we neglect dynamic analysis? Neglecting dynamic analysis by the main designer will really lead to a construction disaster. It's not that the structure will suddenly collapse because we forgot to take into consideration the dynamic loading, although there were some situations in the past which were catastrophic due to neglecting the dynamic loading. But usually it is that the omitting the dynamic analysis will step by step deteriorate the condition of the structure. So we will see additional scratches or settlements, or we can notice the landslides of the embankments. So the structure will be not that durable as if it could, as it could be if we take into account dynamic analysis. What is even more, the continuous exposure to vibration is harmful for people. And it's not, of course, that spending like one hour or even one week or even one month in the apartment when the vibrations are felt is harmful. But spending there months or even years may cause some problems with the blood circulation or rheumatological pains or what is even more, the people might feel irritated or, or aggressive. 
of this slide present basic definitions and dynamic analysis. I believe for most of you it's quite easy and obvious, but I feel like it's mandatory here at least to mention it. So this is the amplitude, period and frequency. Let's imagine the situation that this is the point which vibrates in its unique way and the distance from the stationary position to the extreme position is the maximum amplitude. The period is the time for the one complete vibration. So here the period is 0 0.5 seconds. Frequency is the number of vibration in each second. So 1 divided by period is equal to frequency. Here we can see two different points vibrating in its own way. We can say that the red point here vibrates in high frequency and the blue point here vibrates in low frequency. This is a very important slide here because here I try to explain what are modes of vibration. The vibrational modes of a structure are the shapes that the structure will vibrate in when excited. And these patterns of vibration are, have their own frequency, the frequency of vibration. And I will show you the example later on of the driven pile and I will calculate the modes of vibration of our area of soul. So I hope that you will feel that much better then. We have different kinds of vibrations and different corresponding equations. Here we have three vibrations without damping. This is quite a theoretical situation because in reality we can imagine the situation that the point vibrates all the time. Because usually we have the damping, attenuation, friction and so on. But um, when it comes to the equation, this is the mass matrix, acceleration, the stiffness matrix, and the displacement here, and we have zero on the right-hand side. When it comes to the damp vibrations, the one which happens in, which happen in reality, we have the damping matrix here, which is correlated to velocity. And the first vibrations, we will solve this equation in our example, which will be shown later on. We have, of course, the same, like here on the left-hand side, the same matrices. And on the right-hand side, we have the external dynamic loading, which changes over time. Here I'd like to show you in the simplest way what is high damping and low damping. You can imagine the situation in which the system is excited by the external force which frequency is equal to the free frequency of the system. If we, ha if we have high damping, we can see that the peak, the highest amplitude here, the peak is quite delicate small, but if we have low damping or even almost equal to zero, the amplitude will tend to infinity in the extreme situation. On the next slide we have different types of dynamic loading presented like harmonic loading. Here we have sinus function, the blast load, the square loading, which is some kind of a cyclic loading, and an arbitrary disturbing loading, which cannot be defined by, the, by any fun function. This is the Atkinson diagram, which is very important for those who are interested in dynamic analysis, because it shows different kind of engineering problems and the corresponding range of strains. 
As we can see for the dynamic methods, we are within very small strains and small strains. This is a very important fact here because it means that we have to use the adequate shear or young modulus in our calculations. It, do, it will be explained in a detailed way a bit later. This is definitely my favorite slide. The slide which presents the amazing abilities of soil. The soil which is natural material, not a human-made material and which amazes us all the time. First two pictures present the body waves whereas the last ones present surface waves. First one, the compression wave. As we can see here, the wave propagates from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. But we can notice the, the particles' movements in exactly the same direction, the area of compaction, we can say. So the soil gets thicker and loosened, thicker and loosened. Then we have shear wave. Again, the wave propagates from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. The shear wave is usually slower than the compression wave, but the, the wavelength is usually shorter than the wavelength of the compression wave. As we can see here, there is a movement of the particles of the soil in perpendicular direction to the wave propagation. And then we have love wave, it's a surface wave, and it's a very interesting wave, it's getting more and more interesting now. The wave propagates from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, but the soil particles moves in perpendicular direction to our screens, and what is even more interesting, they are more or less out of balance. And finally, we have Rayleigh wave, the most famous wave, which can run down the buildings during the earthquakes. It has lots of energy. It's the most dangerous Rayleigh wave. So as we can see here, the wave propagates from the left-hand side to the right-hand side again. There is a particle motion in perpendicular direction, something similar to the shear wave. But what is even more interesting here is that there is a rotational motion counterclockwise here. It's a real masterpiece. Okay, so let's go further. We'll try to answer the question, what is soil structure interaction? Most of the civil engineering structures involve some type of structure element with direct contact with the ground. And let's imagine the situation that there are some buildings on the design phase and we want to do some measurements on the building sites before the structure be, will be built. So we go there, we install the sensors and measure the accelerations. Then, after one year, when the structure already exists, we again install the sensors exactly in the same place, but it's the place where the foundation already exists. So, and we measure the accelerations. And what do you think? Are there any differences in accelerations? Of course there are, and a huge differences. And why? The answer is easy. The response of the soil influences the motion of the structure, and the motion of the structure influences the response of the soil. And this is the definition of soil structure interaction. Some conventional structural design methods neglect the SSI effects, and it might be true for relatively easy typical rectangular structures which are situated on relatively stiff soil. But when it comes to the higher buildings like five floors or higher with untypical geometry um, situated on relatively soft soil, 
it is absolutely not true that soil structure interaction must be taken into consideration. As it comes to the computer modeling of SSI, we have two main methods. The direct method, very precise method, and the substructure method. As it comes to the direct method, we model um, the structure and the soil in the same computer program. And it's definitely the most accurate method, but unfortunately, the computer computational effort is much, much higher. We need much more time for, for the solver, for calculations. So when, when it, nowadays, when the time is money, it is a real trade-off and I believe it's better to use the substructure method, which is less precise, but, but the error is acceptable nowadays. And these are two-step calculations. One step is in geotechnical program where we model the soil with the underground part of the structure. We calculate the stiffness factors which we input into the second step of our calculation where we model the structure with the stiffness factors. So the time is money, <laughs> so I believe the substructure method today is much more popular. I already mentioned you about the legal regulations here. I just wanted to write them down. These are, these are the European standards which must be followed in Europe. I believe every country, every region has its own laws which must be followed. And some quotes, of course. This is a very interesting slide. I try to explain you here when you should analyze the dynamic loading, when you should do the dynamic analysis, because sometimes we find the information on the, on the codes, on the standards, like European standards, that the structures are um, very vulnerable for the dynamic analysis, but we are not sure if the vibration are high enough to be analyzed. We are not sure if they are harmful for structure or for people or only for structure or both for people and for structure. <laughs> there are many questions sometimes, sometimes we just don't know what to do. And this slide may help you. It shows the area, the small area of the capital city of Poland, of the Warsaw city. And it's the local development plan. As we can see here, there are some buildings which are on the design phase, which are marked here in black. And they were drawn into the local development plan by the architect and we can see that there are some of the buildings which are within this range of this area between the pink lines what is this area oh excuse me we can read in the local development plan that it's the area which is exposed to additional loads because of the subway and the architect was very surprised then because the architect couldn't see any subway there. So this is very surprising that even though the subway doesn't exist yet, it is on the design phase, we are, we are, there is a, there is a necessity to analyze the dynamic loading from the unexistent source. So that's a very interesting thing, situation, but I just want to let you know that you have to check everything, the local development plans, ask people around <laughs> and visit the institutions which may give you the information. Now we'll move on to the dynamic analysis and computer modeling where I'm gonna lay out different types of dynamic analysis. I just wanna let you know that most of the material is taken from the book shown here, The Soil Dynamics. The author is Bogumił Wrana, who is our 
Principal Consultant, Principal Consultant of Dynafair Solutions. We'll be focused on four most popular types of dynamic analysis. The model analysis, the eigenvalue problem, which is kind of a must have or all other types of dynamic analysis. It's like basics for further calculations, the, the assumptions for further calculations. So we can imagine that if we make an error, the big error here, the other calculations are useless. The results for the eigenvalue problem are of course the free frequencies and the shapes of vibrations. And the other types of dynamic analysis, it's harmonic analysis, which is some kind of a quasi-static analysis. So it's very easy and I don't wanna lose our time to discuss it. And then the total game changer, the spectral analysis and the time history analysis, which will be discussed a bit later. When it comes to the eigenvalue problem, the computer program solves for us this equation which was already discussed in the beginning of the presentation. As we can see, the damping matrix which is correlated with velocity is omitted in this equation. The result of the eigenvalue problem depends on a few things. First, <coughs> the geometry with both area and the layers, the soil layers. As it comes to the area, it's very problematic because we may think that the wider the area, the better. Unfortunately, in, when we develop dynamic analysis, we have to be aware that the wider the geometry, the calculation, which take much more time, even a few days longer. So it's a real trader and we have to be very careful on our decision. Actually, I can say that we need to know what kind, what results we expect, what free frequencies we expect, or, or what shapes of the vibrations we expect. And then the results are also, uh, also depends on the boundary conditions, the constitutive model and the soil parameters, and they also depend, depends on mesh size. We don't have enough time here to, uh, to show you the influence of the mesh size. I just want to mention here that the mesh size is strongly related to the wavelength of the shear velocity. So we absolutely need the additional geological investigation to measure the wavelength of the shear wave because if we don't have this knowledge we may filter out the frequencies which are relevant in our calculations. Oh, this is a very important slide which shows the most adequate constitutive models for dynamic analysis. The first one is linear elastic models and the other ones are more complex as we go further. So the linear elastic model is known by all of us, I believe, we can model here the, the railway damping. The, I believe the most popular damping, which is associated with the viscosity of the material and is frequency dependent. And what is important here is that the linear, the, the elastic modulus is directly related to the velocity of the shear wave, shear wave velocity. The equation for the shear wave velocity is shown here and again the additional geological investigations are necessary to capture the velocity of the shear wave and the equation is shown here, it depends on the shear modulus and the soil density. I'd like to show you the Atkinson diagram which is right here. It shows different engineering problems and the corresponding strain ranges. As we can see for the dynamic methods we are within the very small strains and small strains. So this is a very important information here because we have to 
define the adequate elastic modulus which corresponds to the very small and small strains as we analyze the dynamic analysis. And then we have hardening soil HS model, which provides you with a nonlinear stress strain behavior. So it's, uh, it's adequate when we expect, expect strongly nonlinear behavior of the material, of course. And what is even more, it provides you with a stress dependency of the stiffness. It is very important, especially for granular soils, as the shear modulus is highly dependent on confining pressure. Uh, and again, we can define the Rayleigh damping here. And last but not least, the hardening soil with small strain stiffness, HAS. Its most important feature here is that we can put into the model directly the small strain shear modulus. It's very useful feature as it can be done in the previously discussed models. And what is even more, we can also define in our, in our model in computer program, the modulus reduction factor as we, because it's a very important, which reflects the very important feature of the material because for most soil, as we increase the shear strain, the shear model is the case. So this feature reflects, reflects it. And it's especially important when it comes to the earthquakes, as we have a wide range of strains there and we don't, we can't control it. And another new thing about the hardening soil with small strain stiffness is that we can define the hysteretic damping. It, it much differs from the previously discussed Rayleigh damping. We don't have enough time to compare it today, but hysteretic damping, just in a few words, is associated with some energy dissipation and the frictional damping. Here, on the contrary, I'd like to compare the dynamic modulus and the static modulus and the different definitions of Young modulus for the corresponding constitutive models. As we remember from the previous slide, when it comes to the dynamic analysis, we are within very small and small strains. So this is a very important thing, so I just want you to remember this and that's why I put it again here on the next slide. And what this graph presents, it presents different definition of the Young modulus for different constitutive models. I just want to compare here the linear elastic model and the very, very popular Mohr Coulomb model. We use Mohr Coulomb model for most of the static engineering problems, and we need to define then the second stiffness E50, which is shown here. When we go to the linear elastic model, we define the initial stiffness, which is shown here. As we can see, the initial stiffness can be a few times bigger, higher than a second stiffness. So, in, when it comes to the dynamic analysis, when we develop the dynamic analysis, the Morculum model is not adequate. This is not the correct model for defining the constitutive model when we develop the dynamic analysis. And it's a very important information for you. On this graph, on the contrary, I wanted to compare the dynamic modulus and the static modulus. As we can see in the extreme situation for the cohesive soils, the dynamic modulus can be over 10 times higher than a static modulus. So it is very important, I just want to put an emphasis on that, that it's very important to put the correct modulus on the into the computer program for dynamic analysis, which usually much differ from the static modulus.
Despite the model analysis, the eigenvalue problem, we had spectral analysis. Spectral analysis is especially important when it comes to the structure, when we want to calculate the additional forces due to dynamic loading. So it's not that important when it comes to the people's comfort, safety, but very, very important when it comes to the structure. And what is response spectrum? Because response spectrum is something that we input to the computer program and which will give us the additional forces acting on the structure. So the response spectrum, as we can see on this graph here, is something like that we change the, our complicated system, which is changed into the series of oscillators of varying natural frequencies and the lowest frequency and the highest frequency is here. So we write the new graph which reflects the maximum amplitudes of each oscillator. So it is some kind of the peak response, we can imagine it, right? And then the program automatically will calculate the additional inertia forces which should be put at into our computer program, into our combinations, calculation combination. So the inertia forces depend on the spectrum, the response spectrum of course, but also on the weight. The weight that vibrates in the corresponding natural mode and the co with a corresponding frequency, right? It's quite complicated and hard to explain in a few words, we don't have much time here, but you can, you can just read manual of the GTSNX and they, it's explained there in a more detailed way, right? And here is the exemplary response spectrum, as we can see it depends, there is an amplitude here on Y and the period here on X axis. Then we have time history analysis, which is crucial for people's comfort especially, but also for the structure. But the time history analysis is something much different from the spectral response. It is much more time consuming because there is an integration over time done by the computer program, of course. But what is important here that when we have the source measured by the sensor close to the source, of course, we can directly put the velocity or the acceleration into the computer program. Of course, it's up to us what time period we choose and what time step, which of course depends on the frequency. Okay. So I think that I try to explain to you all of the dynamic analysis, the eigenvalue problem, the spectral response, and the time history analysis. So now we can move on to the seismic boundary conditions and different types of dynamic loading. When it comes to the boundary conditions mm, in dynamic analysis, it's much more complicated because the calculations are in time, so it has to approximate the behavior not only in space but also in time. We have two um, main methods, the substructure method and the direct method. Of course we all know that the soil is infinite, so it's not like a structure that it's easy to find where to put the boundary condition. When it comes to the soil, it's very difficult. What area we should take into account and why? So when it comes to the substructure method, the method proposes um, to model the structure and the part of the soil in which we expect the non-linear behavior. And the rest of the soil where we expect a linear behavior is just simply cut off and we put the boundary conditions on the edges. But the forces are very difficult to calculate here because the, they approximate the elastic infinite area in space but also in time when it comes to the dynamic analysis. The more popular 
maybe less accurate but very much easier to implement is the direct methods which propose the model the structure the above ground structure with the area in which we don't know if we have the linear or non-linear behavior we don't care about this but what is important we have to put the implement to model the boundary conditions which will absorb the waves so that the wave didn't reflect from the boundary condition and didn't come back to the structure right and it's much easier to calculate the absorbing forces on the boundary than in a substructure method okay so i'll from now on i will concentrate on direct method because it's commonly used among all in all computer programs so as i said earlier the determination of absorbing forces on the boundary is in a simplified matter so we are aware of the fact that we we make an error but it's absolutely acceptable so again it's the best value for money right and we have different types of boundary conditions we have viscous boundary which is most popular probably the extrapolation boundary superposition boundary infinite boundary paraxial boundary and double asymptotic boundary of course in the literature you can find more information about it we will mainly focus on viscous boundary and infinite element which are most popular currently so what boundaries do we use for which dynamic analysis when it comes to the model analysis we use the simplest boundary conditions just elastic boundaries like for most static problems so we don't put any damping here it's done automatically so we don't bother here i just put a screenshot showing how it's calculated but i'm sure that you already know it so i'll just skip it okay Another type of boundary condition dynamic analysis is a viscous boundary condition, which was explained by Listmer and Kochlemeyer in 69, but still used. And what, is, what are the rules? The wave is absorbed regardless of the excitation frequency. So this is important for us. It doesn't matter if the frequency is 5 Hertz or 30 Hertz, the wave will be absorbed. So, another thing, the area should be large enough due to the angle of incidence, because unfortunately the, the quite big disadvantage of this boundary condition, the viscous boundary condition, is that the wave coming to the boundary should be close to 90 degrees. So, this is quite problematic. So. It means in another way, we can say that the area must be large enough, but of course not too large, as we can imagine. And what is more, it's adequate when the source of vibration is inside the model. It's obvious because of the angle of incidence. So when it comes to the earthquakes, this viscous boundary won't be, won't be a good choice. And again, in manual, we can find some more information about the viscous boundary. When it comes to the time history analysis, another boundary also commonly used when a dynamic analysis is done is the absorbent boundary. It's exactly the same in GTS and X. It's it's like a viscous boundary, but it's defined in a bit different way. So I can't explain it here because you have to start working on GTS and X and modeling the dynamic loading to understand, but it's just a little bit different way to model it, which sometimes is just easier and faster to do it. 
And last but not least is the free field boundary used in time history analysis, which is some kind of modeling the infinity. And, but the, the important thing here is that the free field is the free field element and the viscous damping in one. So this is two in one, we can say. And it is especially important to use a free field boundary if the source of vibration is outside the model. So it's, it's obvious that it's perfect for the earthquakes. But what is the disadvantage? The biggest disadvantage here is that the calculation will take us much more time because the program needs to calculate two or even three parallel problems. And here are some screenshots which are presenting you how to model it. This slide is taken from GTS and X manual and it, it's really friendly. I think you should take a look at this later because it shows the comparison of the different kinds of dynamic boundary conditions and the results for the exemplary node, it was it the node was like I think somewhere here, and here we have the displacements over time for this node using different boundary conditions. In GTSNX, you have possibility to define different kinds of dynamic loading, like response spectrum, ground acceleration, time varying statics, dynamic node or dynamic surface. So it's very easy to implement the, the function, the loading from the external file or just to define the function using the GTSNX itself. When you start working on GTSNX on the dynamic analysis, you'll see that it's very, very easy to model dynamic loading of different types, what I've just said. It's very intuitive modeling. We can add a function or upload it, upload our in situ measurements. It also provides us with most popular boundary conditions, which are applied almost automatically. And last but not least, the GTSNX has great manual which explains the feature of dynamic analysis step by step. And finally, I'd like to show you the example of driven pile in which I will implement the information provided earlier. This is the equation that the GTSNX will solve for us. This is the picture, the real picture taken for, from the, uh, the building site. We installed the measurements, the sensors on the pile right here. And we did the measurements to catch the acceleration of the pile. And then we implemented this into the computer program. But first, this is the must-have of all dynamic analysis, we have to solve the Aiken Valley problem. And as I said earlier, for soil, it's very problematic because it's not only the thing of the constitutive model which we want to choose, but also what area we should take into consideration. So I started with a quite wide area using the most popular among all static calculation, the more Coulomb constitutive model. And I received, I calculated the first free frequency and it was 1.74 Hertz. As I said earlier, the, the more Coulomb is not the great, it's not a good choice when it comes to dynamic analysis. So now we know that it's not a good constitutive model and we'd like to compare it with the right one, with the elastic, model, elastic modulus of the linear elastic constitutive model. As we can see, the first free vibration is 3.57, so it's 
twice as much as for the Merkulant model. And then I realized that uh, the geometry is too wide and it takes me too much time um, to do the integration over time. So I want to make it smaller. And again, I, I didn't change the constitutive model. I just changed one thing, the width of the model, and I received the 8.36 Hertz. So it's again almost twice as much as the for the wider model. And again, I realized that there's no need to analyze that wide model and I even made it smaller about five meters in width. And this time I received the first free vibration equal to around 10 Hertz. But what is interesting here that I received the new mode of vibration for the 2.35, excuse me, 23.4. So quite a high free vibration. And what is interesting here, this is something that we and our company expected because we knew that the most harmful uh, vibration when we, we are driving the pile is around 30, 25 Hertz. And this frequency will give us the highest accelerations on the surface. So this is the area that we are mostly interested in because this is the area where the buildings will be set, right? And now we can go further and we, we would like to check if our geometry, the boundary condition, the constitutive model is correct. So at first, before I analyze the dynamic loading taken from the in situ measurement, I'd like to check the correctness applying quite an easy loading, dynamic loading, like this one. This is the decreasing pressure, we can say. Of course, it is applied on the pile. And let's see what's going on then. We can see that the waves are perfectly absorbed by the boundary condition. And we can stop here because the, the loading is almost equal to zero now because we are somewhere here. So what is good here and what we should, we should analyze, we should check, is that the boundary condition absorb the waves. There can be any reflection or refraction of the wave and it actually happens so that's, that's perfect actually. Okay, so we can go further and check how it is when we apply the carbonic loading and the, the applied frequency is equal to 30 Hertz. Unfortunately here, it's very, very difficult to analyze anything to check the correctness of our project because the frequency is very high. It changes very quickly, even though it's a slow motion because you can choose the motion in GTS and X, but it's very, very difficult. So as I said previously, it's good to start with a decreasing pressure force and then go further. Okay. And the last applied load is the real one taken from the building side. It's the, the real probe, the, the real sample. And as we can see, it's some kind of a cyclic loading, but we cannot say what is the frequency. And let's see what's going on. Actually, it's much, much different from the other results because we can see that there are some moments where the, the acceleration is almost constant or there are moments when the machine doesn't work. It's almost zero acceleration for a short time period. 
So it looks much, much different from the other results. Okay, so I'd like to here, I'd like to show you um, one more thing here. Yes, it's another important feature in GTS and X that you can draw the, the graph of the acceleration for the chosen exemplary node. For example, let's say that the pi is driving right here and we are interested in the result of this node because, I don't know, maybe there is a foundation there or, or the foundation is planned to build in a few hours, it doesn't matter. I just want to check the accelerations. We, before our calculation, we have to choose which nodes we want to see the results and the GTS and X will draw the results of the accelerations or velocities or the force for this node. So it's another great feature in GTS and X. Thank you very much for your attention. I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you.